I am Christy, your host. Uh, RJ, the other host, is out helping a family friend um, catch a cow to get doctored. And then he was going to work with said family friend's son um, on his team roping. So um, they've been gone, I don't know, they left early this morning. It's 11 now, so <laughs> it is what it is. Um, They'll be home probably about noon, one, I don't know. Uh, the thing is, is that when RJ goes over there, they always cook a big breakfast. So, um, yeah, they'll probably eat a late good breakfast before they come home. So, she likes to cook up. Um, the young man on the weekends lives, and the family friend is the grandma. So, grandma makes everything from eggs, bacon, sausage, pancakes, and puts out an entire spread for them. Um, needless to say, during the week, the young man goes and, and goes back home to his mom. So, yeah. On Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, he's with Grandma and Grandpa. And then the other days, he's down with his uh, mom. So, anyway, this is RJ's last day to help him with that cow. So, it is what it is. All right. In the barn stalls, we've started breeding season. Yay! Um... We actually have some footage of us sorting. I can't say as it was good footage because it's very windy. So we're taking out all the sound out of that and we'll just put maybe some music in the background or something. I don't know what we'll do. But here is that footage of the sorting of one of the pans of breeding season. We also put all the goats together. Um, we did not put in Camille, Sienna, and Cinnamon, but Cat, Curly, uh, Holly, and Sweetie are all playing with the Billy. A Cisco Kid is who our Billy is. So, um, Little Ash has had his own 
issues. We don't know why. He just seemed bleh. And honestly, I'm not sure it's not the weather playing with him. Last night, it was down to like 53 degrees. We get up at 5 in the morning, it's 53 degrees. By 10 o'clock, it was 87 yesterday. So as the day goes on into one, it's in the 90s, almost to the 100s, and then at night, it's 50-some degrees. So I honestly think some of his stuff stems from that shift back and forth constantly during the day. So we will, um, we've been giving him for the vet some red cell. It's kind of an energy drink. Um, it was supposed to be better than um, the electrolytes and Pedialyte that we do because it helps also with his iron and copper and everything. So um, we're giving him that. He got it. I think his last dose was yesterday. So um, Knight still has his leg issue. It's looking better. He's been on penicillin, getting there. We did have to remove the Shetland ram. We have found, and this will be, we're supposed to use him this year and next year. He's aggressive to the other sheep, and he hurt Rammy, then Lester, and, and pretty much he's going to have to be pinned by himself. So uh, we may put him in with a bull, because if he hits the bull in the leg, the bull's going to turn around and knock him out. Just saying. So that is one issue that we're having. Um, and I wish I could say that it's come on just since the weather change, but we've been dealing with this now even just in the ram pen, and they're not exposed to females. So it's not the shift in the weather where everything's coming into to heat or cycle. So it's just the way he is. He, he's shorter, and he feels the need to um, hit them. And of course he's short, so he just hits him in the legs. Well, that's not good for the others. Um, he just—I think what I'm talking—he feels the need to assert his dominance in that pin, and I'm not sure why. No women around to impress, but I don't know if he thinks that they're going to bully him on this. Not it—it it would be equivalent to um, what we call mighty dog syndrome. The reason that moose bites uh, is because he's the littlest dog on the place. So he thinks he's got to be all that, which he's over there sleeping, so I was hoping saying his name didn't wake him up. That's the last thing I need is another yippee dog. Um, so anyway, breeding season, Dirt oh, has now graduated out of the barn. We didn't even, we have not been putting him up for even the heavy dew, um, and he made it out during a little sprinkle. We're waiting on the farrier to come this week. If there's any soft spots, we'll know then. So as long as all the soft spots are go gone, we're good. His frog has started to grow back. His hoof is shaping up nicely. We'll know for definite after the farrier comes, but honestly, I think it's just now a matter of time for that hoof to grow. And as it grows and trims and grows and trims, it'll be fine. So I, I really think that's where we're at with Derp. I can't confirm that until the farrier comes, which he's supposed to be here this week. So keep your fingers crossed. Hopefully Derp is done, having to be put up and having to be babied and, and you know what I mean? He just, he'll be a normal horse. Yay! Um, Kavayu, um, he went and got fixed last Friday. And he is doing wonderful. We've watched for flies and all that kind of stuff, and he seems to be healing up really well. Uh, RG and I, we didn't want to fuss with him for the first week, so we just kind of took him out there and we'd halter him and kind of look. Um, he did bleed a little bit, so he's got dirt down his legs and stuff. RJ today, um, we're going to take, and when he gets home, we're going to wash off his legs a little bit and make sure that everything is fine, that we're not missing anything. Um, with it being a week out, if or worst case scenario, if we have missed something, which I don't think we have, he'd go on an antibiotic. So, um, just being careful with him. Just being careful. That's all there is. Um, I think that's really it for in the barn stalls. Um, we've still got baby chicks in the barn. Other than that, the barn is empty. Um, Daisy has gone to beating up on the other females, and she is, it's fall. 
So they're going to want to breed too. And she's beating up on the other little females. And I guess she wants to go back to laying eggs. I don't know. Uh, she's escaped the barn. She leaves the barn. Whatever. She's fine. Um, all right. Mending fences. We had trailer issues. We thought we had them fixed. And lo and behold, we didn't. So we had to take the U-bolt. Our... All right. I'm going to see if I can explain this the way the guy did. He told me. The weight of your axle is defined or identified by the bolt pattern on your hubcap. So we got the U bolt for a five bolt pattern. Got them home and found out that our trailer is a six bolt pattern. The U bolt that we have. Um, It is a heavy duty one in a certain weight, but now they only make that weight about this much too long on each side. A U-bolt is, is literally, it's a U with threads on both ends, and then down here it's clear. Okay, so, let me, let me, okay, now don't judge. This is my little, okay. This is a U-bolt. Your axle sits right in, whoops, I'm going the wrong way, this right here and so that it can spin. And then there's nuts that screw down on this over the frame thing and hold the big uh, springs that we need for the trailer, okay? So simply put, the ones that are that match this bottom curve that we need have way too much of this okay it would extend the ones that we have are short and i think the i think ours was seven inches long and the shortest one we could find was 18. so we are calling the actual manufacturer of the trailer and we're going to see if we can get some from them they had to get them someplace, right? So we're figuring we should be able to get them for them, from them. Um, the solar panels are going to go up on the roof this week. Um, I've decided that it comes with a little frame. I bought it used. Keep in mind that I bought it used. Uh, and there's three of them. 50 watt, whatever. They're little, but it's enough to take care of the, that barn out there. Um, so, they're going to go up on the barn. I still have to get a converter and then we'll be fine um, and batteries which we have old batteries out there we're going to try those first um, so those are going to go up on the roof and it sits on a little frame and I'm just going to toss the frame away one of the legs is broke and all that but the panels are just fine so we're going to attach them to two by fours and attach those two fours right to the south side of the barn roof so um, that will be going in hopefully today. Uh, not today. This week. This podcast, by next podcast, I should have something to tell you about them. So, we hope. Uh, also, we have had to, um, in the winter, I lose my classroom. And it becomes hay storage. So, it half of the barn is now full pretty much with hay. We've got, I think we figured out, like 300 bales that we need to do again. So we're going to do half the right away, and we'll be good. Uh, we just oversold for not cutting that half, which we knew. We, we always have a backup plan. Always, always, always. We can't afford to be short of hay. So um, we sell for what is out in our pasture, and we only sell what we think we need, but we apparently backpack the two barns a little bit better, and it holds a little bit more. So we allowed Kevin to instead of only selling him 400 bales we sold him 500 bales but the truth of the matter is I still have 300 bales that need to go in there so I would have been short whether I oversold to Kevin or not fact of life so um, we always have a backup uh, if we didn't need it we'd leave it standing that's just the way we do I know that sounds terrible it, it just is so um, anyway so I had to redo the barn. 
I'll have to go out and I'll try and put a little um, picture in because now my drying rack is in the shop, my tumbler is in the shop, um, my washing station is right outside the shop door, and I've had to condense down all the um, displays to the grid wall. So I probably will be um, buying some more hooks, some more little shelves to go on it. But it really, so far it looks cute. It's not done, not by a long shot, but it's getting there. So here's the picture of that. Okay, so that takes us right into the yarn farm. Um, we have two uh, booths that we're going to have. One is going to be dedicated more to bags, and the other one is going to be dedicated more to fiber. The first one is the Dalton Days. We've been invited up there. Last year we had some uh, scheduling conflicts. So this year we don't, and we will be up there on Friday, September 3rd. 31st or September 30th, I don't remember what the last day of the month is, and October 1st. So we'll be up there and it will be more bags and stuff than it will be, we'll take some yarn, but, and I will be spinning when I'm there. But um, we will have probably more bags for sale just because that's what we'll sell in the area. Uh, we will take our cards, distribute literature, that kind of stuff. Um, then the uh, excuse me. Then the uh, Omega Wool Fest coming up in January, and I already have the date, but I didn't write it down, so I can't tell you what it is. But it is January, and we are going to be there again. So, and I'm hoping to take my fiber notebook stuff. I've got Camel for the fiber notebook class, um, and I've got Cutie Cross, and then I think I'm gonna do. Dorset and I think I was going to do five of them. Five, so probably Dorset, Mohair, and Shetland, I think. So, yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. Anyway, we're going to do that. Um, then we're going to move right on into the, in the fields. Of course, haying season is still going on. Uh, Lee has been brush hogging the ragweed. RJ and I have been paying the price. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> uh, yeah, not a good thing. When you have allergies and asthma, ragweed is not your friend. Just saying. So he's trying to knock it down before the they go. It goes to bloom. But when you cut it, it kind of goes into self defense mode and just bleh. so. Um, there was one day that RJ and I both had a headache. Lee was down and he uh, cut the, the um, ragweed down by the pond and the wind was out of the south. And we, RJ was trying to rope and he's like, I have to go to the house. And so <laughs> we both came in and just kind of locked ourselves in, turned the air conditioner on, let it filter a little bit, you know, that kind of stuff. So. Anyway, um, also Lee has been brush hogging the garden, the orchard pretty regular. I'm going to get out there and try and reclaim some more of the garden. I found one bed and then the other and so just doing it one at a time. Not getting too super excited but it is what it is. Um, I'm hoping to get out there and see if we have any apples or pears. I had seen some but I don't know if they're ripe. And I don't know if the birds got to him before we will. So, yeah, we'll see. All right, in the farmhouse, oh man, I went to a yarn shop opening. Uh, I was kind of disappointed. There was no breed specific wool um, at all. There was only one, and I was in Missouri. So I expected to see made in Missouri kind of product from Shepherds, you know, from, from Missouri Shepherds. And I walked into a commercial shop pretty much. Um, I just, everything, they had those Turkish drop spindles, they were plastic. They had lucid, we were, they were plastic. Um, not really any, they did have some yarn bowls that were handmade. 
Well, actually, I don't know if they were handmade. They looked handmade. I didn't pick them up. It could have said made in China for all I know. They had some shawl pins that looked very commercial. I, I don't know that the yarn, and they were um, glass hearts, so it, or ceramic hearts, so I'm pretty sure whoever did the bowls did the pins, but I don't know if they were commercially produced or whether they were produced um, by an individual. Woo! There was one person that's an indie dyer that had her stuff in, and it was very expensive. Um, I saw one skein of like 54 yards for like $20. Uh, I know that that's markup on it. You, you know, I, I know that, that that's, and it, I was just like, oh my gosh, we, we don't charge that, you know. Um, so there was no real breed specific anything, um, no, no spinning stuff at all, although she did advertise drop spindle classes, but she didn't really sell, oh, that's not true, she did have like four braids of stuff, but it was like merino top with tensile in it, and either bamboo or silk or something. I can't remember, but it's not a beginner fiber. I'll be honest with you. If she tries to teach people to drop spindle on that fiber, they're going to get discouraged because that's not um, its not a good starter wool. And, and everybody knows you don't really start with merino. It's too slick for most people. So, And you have to put a lot of spin on it while twisting it. So I don't know. I was just kind of disappointed and honestly it wasn't even two walls her couch probably took up more room than the little bit of yarn she had she had one three section shelf that there were those little cubicle ones and there were three sections wide and then she had another one that was three sections wide and there was a gap in between them and they were facing this way and this way you know and then on another wall down she had a nut, two of those put side by side like a big bookshelf. And then on the other wall across there, I think she had just one there. And they were all done in sections of three, you know. Um, 95, 97% commercial yarn. So um, you could go online and buy the same stuff a little bit cheaper probably. Uh, cute shop. Um, but... I guess I just, because I'm a producer, I guess I look more and more for made in Missouri products, hand washed, hand done, real merino. I don't want merino super wash. That is my big thing, is I don't spin merino super wash. I can't stand it. I don't know if it's a mental thing. I understand that hand spinners want to be able to throw it in the washer. I get that. But if you're going to take the time to hand spin it, hand spin it and make a hand garment, why wouldn't you take the time to hand wash it? I don't know. So, I'm just not a big fan of superwash. And here's the other thing is we know the process for that and it's a chemical stripping of the fiber. Well, anybody that's followed us for very long knows that RJ is chemically sensitive. So, no superwash merino for us. And I don't like spinning it. So, I, and I don't know if it's because I'm biased that I don't like spinning it, but yeah, I just don't. I, I don't. So, I didn't buy any fiber. I didn't buy any yarn. I did talk to her and tell her that if she wanted to do dyes, that I had the kits from Greener Shades and that they would work perfect for a home dye thing. Um, she seemed she seemed just interested enough because it was a grand opening, but not really interested enough. Does that make sense? So you kind of got the feeling that when she said, yeah, I'll call you, she's she probably not going to call me. So it is what it is. Um, I'm a firm believer in greener shades, so it will be what will be. You know, that's what we use here, and that's what we're going to stick to. So Anyway, so I went to that, a little disappointed, but I had taken a friend and she wanted to show me this other store that was in Springfield and it was Fabric Outlet 
Oh, that more than made up for the disappointment of the yarn shop. Um, <laughs> that's terrible. Um, yeah. Okay, so I went to the fabric store. <laughs> um, it is fabric, the fabric outlet, I believe is what they call it. Or the village fabric I, it fabric outlet. Online, it's not called fabric outlet. It, it's called something different, and I can't remember what it is. Um, but anyway, while I was there, I hit the $2 table. And I got some cute things, um, just because. Now, I was there to get the backing for my bedspread. They sell 108-inch backing. For anywhere from $7.99 to $11.99 a yard. Yeah. So that is the same price as regular material. And material is typically 45 to 54 inches wide. So you get double the fabric. But it is made for backing. Um, it doesn't come in, in lots and lots of pretty colors. They do have some. The $11.99, they had a lot of tie-dye and bright colors. I went for a plain little cream uh, printed, uh, but it, it's just a two-tone, okay, each on beige kind of thing, okay? Okay, I'm back. Um, I wasn't going to show you because I don't know that the camera's going to show up, but it is cream colored, and, but it's not solid. It has, like, little viney leaves. Can you see that? Okay, and it is cream colored on cream colored, so it's not, and it, even when you hold it flat like this, when I, like, see, you can't see it at all. It's like that in real life. Like if I hold it out like this, if you lay it flat, you really can't see it. But then you just kind of turn it. And it gives it that little bit of depth. Does that make sense? So um, just enough to keep it interesting, and, but nothing too flashy. It's for the back of a very nice uh, bedspread. So I got that. And I gave $7.99 for that. Uh, and like I said, it's 108 inches wide. Um, it's almost as cheap as buying just a sheet. Then on the $2 table, they had this table of, of fabric for like $2.99 a yard or two. It wasn't very expensive. So the first thing I came across that I got was this. And I know it looks kind of funky, but this would make a great fall liner for all the fall bags that I do and the bags that have this color in it. So, um... And with Dalton Days coming up, I am going to be doing some fall bags. And I'm going to do some drawstring bags that are not peekaboo. So we'll be taking all of those. And I wanted to do some backpack type bags with the peekaboo in them for the kids. So this is more liner than anything. Uh, then I found uh, this. And I like this just because of this. And this is a light blue. And it, this is brown. Everything is printed in brown. This is my favorite scene from it, but it has others, and it's kind of the older fashion style uh, fabric, and this is also heavier style. This is more like a canvas type fabric than a cotton, and I love, I'm getting more and more into those canvas and upholstery type bags. I love it. So anyway, so I got that, and they only sell by the yard. So, if you're going to buy a half yard, forget it. They won't let you. Then, I looked down at the $2 table, and I bought something that I never would have bought. But, I one of the things that we did with Belle this year was we taught her to sew. And she made bags for all of her family um, for Christmas. Now, they don't watch this video podcast. Belle hit and miss sometimes, not really. So, anyway, we taught her to sew. And she, her grandma got her a sewing machine. So if you sew it all, <laughs> I'm seeing how I can do this. If you sew it all, you've seen those panels that um, are like pre-sewn little wall hanging things or they make great lap robes or something like that. Um, there's stuffed turkeys. I didn't, my nativity set is done with one of those and I sewed it and you stuff each individual piece. Um, there's books. They're, they're just pre-printed panels that you sew together in a certain way to make something. Well, while I was there, I found a fabulous fashion tote 
in an urban safari print. And as you can tell by what you've seen, it is definitely different. Okay. And here is what it's pretty much going to look like when it's done. <laughs> now, Belle has a little cousin that lives with her grandmother. And they look for things to do. So not only did I get one of these, I got two. So that her and her cousin can now make these god-awful bags. <laughs> I, told her, I, said, I told her grandma, I said it was... Um, Sorry, my hair is bothering me. Uh, it just wants to go, and I'm trying to get rid of bangs, so yeah, I probably should do it that way. I don't know which way I blow dried it. Anyway, um, so I told her grandma, and this is actually, and this is a light blue, and it's like giraffe print, and then, oh, and the little baubles and the, the envelope, they have little, um, they always have the directions on them. Okay, so how to do it is written there for the girls. Now, these are teenage girls. Belle is 15, and her sister, or her cousin, I'm not going to say her name because they don't know that I podcast, number one. And number two, I don't have permission. Belle, everybody knows her, and her grandma knows that we do, and she's actually appeared on the podcast. So um, her cousin is how we'll refer to her. It, I think is 12 or 13. So they're they're pretty close in age, um, but anyway, it, they'll be able to do this. But on the bottom of this, it comes with like little embellishments <laughs> that you can stuff and sew on. Um, little roses and Celtic stuff. And yeah, it's cute. So they can just decorate them the way they want. Um, it's got some brown zebra in it too, and it's got some white zebra print, and I don't know if it's supposed to be cow print or what. Anyway, it is a very eclectic mix, but Belle and her little cousin can make these together with the little directions that are on there, and then they can either give them away, you know, to someone if they don't really like them themselves, or they can keep it themselves just as a, you know, I'm all about making memories. And if Belle can make memories with her cousin to say, hey, remember those awful bags we made that one lady gave us? Oh, my God, you know. So that will be, uh, I'm going to have to stop and do something with this mess. Um, That will be very well worth it for me. So anyway, I got her those. Then I did get uh, three other materials. And they're all horsey materials. I got this one. And the gray right over here and over there, uh, over here, are like silhouette horses. They're, they're like the shadows, I guess you'd say. So I got that one. Um, then I got RJ's favorite, which is not my favorite. It's little scenes of horses. He loves the color and the scenes of horses. So uh, we'll make a bag out of that one. And this, I don't know why, because normally he's the blue kid. I found this, and I fell in love with it, and I don't know. It is all blue, and I can see a bag made out of this. I, I just can't, so uh, I don't know. It just it is what it is, and I can see blue, solid blue lining. Um, I just like it. So I got those at the fabric outlet while we were at at Springfield so yeah. the yarn shop eh, not so much now the girlfriend that I went with brought RJ and Lee some treasures well she brought me some treasures too now what started all this and she's like she had it for me and then um, she just started adding to it okay now this is the main purpose for the treasure that came down and this is one of the few known pictures of Lee's Aunt Kate. Aunt Kate is the young, is the lady that um, bought this house and then sold it to his mom for a dollar. Really no money exchange hands. That's just what it says on the abstract. Um, but this is an article that talks about Fred Lowry and Shoat and um, the Lowry tradition living on in Lenapaw. Uh, and this article was done back in 1971. 
and he was, um, Fred Lowry was a champion roper who is pretty much responsible for making show Lee's famous uncle. So Lee not only has a famous uncle, he has a famous great uncle. Now and the saddle that was featured in this right here is a Veet saddle from the Veet Saddle Company. Veach, I'm sorry. And I also have the history of the Veach saddle. So this and this are all going to go into a another frame and be framed um, together. Some so. of the other things that she brought us, and she was going to these rodeos as a kid, while Lee's great or Lee's uncle and great uncle were participating in them. So while Lee grew up with all of these people, she was just a kid observing. Um, later, her dad went on to actually work for Fred Lowry at the Lowry Ranch, um, which is the great uncle. So uh, we, to make a long story short, I did not know her. Um, the two families, when he quit working for Fred and moved away, that was pretty much it. You know, they they saw each other on the road sometimes, but that was it. It wasn't a, a close contact. I met up with her. She happens to be a fiber artist, and it's her dad that worked for my husband's great uncle. So that was kind of weird. But anyway, she also brought me this. And this is the first annual No Water Roundup Club. No Water is our county, and, and we used to live in No Water, but Lynn, it's No Water County is the county seat. Uh, and the other yeah. things that were in here are, here is some old uh, bills, sale bills from the Stampede, Tulsa Stampede. Um, here is the Will Rogers Memorial, which this right here, uh, Harry used to run with Clem McSpadden, who was a very famous announcer. And let me flip to the page. Um, here is where he started, and he was introduced. This is introducing Clem McSpadden as an announcer. This is his announcing introduction. They, there used to be the Hoof and Horns magazines. And, okay. Now this is uh, a gentleman that rodeoed with Shote and Fred Lowry. And his name is Buck Rutherford. And he's from right here in town. But one of his first paying jobs is Bluebell Wranglers. Fit for champions. So George Strait is now the Wrangler man, and Buck Rutherford used to be, and that is a, a man that used to run with Harry and them. So that's a high, I mean, I haven't told anybody yet, but Shote was actually contacted to be the Marlboro man, and he turned it down because he didn't want people thinking of him as smoking. He didn't smoke, didn't want anything to do with it, and there's no way he was even going to pretend. He wasn't going to be that cowboy riding across the range, even if he didn't have to put a cigarette in his mouth. So... These guys are really famous guys. In one of these, if I can find it, um, this is the, nope, that's the finals. Hang on, it might be in this same hoofson. There is a section that talks about what's going on. Oh, yes, here it is. What goes on in, in every area. Now, you have to remember that Clark McIntyre is Reba McIntyre's father. And he just here recently passed away. And he used to go with Shote and them and rodeo and do the roundups. And they used to move cattle for Shote. And Reba was there. Lee's known Reba and Pike and, and the older daughter. I don't even know the older daughter's name anymore. But anyway, he, as a child, when these, he's 50 years old now. But as a child, that was Reba. She was older than him. They didn't hang out or anything. But these families all come together to do these things. Well, in this little hoof, and it says, it says down Oklahoma way and the second thing that was going on in this magazine at this point in time is right there and I know I can't get it on camera so I'm going to do you the gesture of reading this to you for the Clark McIntyre's for the and I'm reading it word for word okay I didn't say they had great editors either for the Clark McIntyres, it's a girl. March 28th, the little missy has been named Reba. This makes two girls and a boy for Clark and Jackie 
for Clark and Jackie, who now live in Kiowa, Oklahoma. So, this is Reba McIntyre's birth announcement. Um, and we can find out just how old she is, huh? Because this is May of 1955, and she was born in March. Um, March 28th of 1955. Those hooves, playbills, postcards, treasure. And we loved it. So, um, it's amazing. It, it's just, there's too many to even go over all of them. So, um, we had fun with that. So, anyway, all right. Moving on to on the porch. So, I guess I need to wrap this up. It's kind of getting long, I think. I don't know. Um, I'm not really watching the time because I've got two other little segments there. All right, on the porch, I've been working on my fair stuff, which I don't know. I just, whatever I'm doing, I whip one out for the fair. Um, I took my photo, and it was just a fluke. I love it. And so this is the photo that I'm entering in the fair. And in our fair, you have to have them ready to mount. They have to be on the thing. But if you look, you, even in this little mirror right here, you can see them working. You can see the same photo real little and then get closer. And, of course, you can see it's in my rear view. So, cool little pic. And then I made two hot mats just because. Um, doing my part to keep our county fair entries up. The more county fair entries they get, the bigger the county fair uh, budget is. So if I, a person who doesn't win money, enter several times, the kids that win money, there's more opportunities for them to win because of a bigger budget, if that makes sense. So um, the other two things I think I showed you, my poem, my bag, uh, so that is what I've been working on. And I've been working on my camel thing. I'm going to move this over here. Because the other thing I've been working on is not for the fair. And it is getting ready to reopen the Etsy shop. So let me put all this over here. And if you follow us on Facebook, you know I have been working on bats. Beautiful bats. I have red and purple bats. This is Cotswold. I have pink, purple, and see the colors aren't really coming out very well. Let's see if we can adjust this. Um, there we go. Okay. That is actually pretty close. Um, I did some, now this is going to look funky, but it's not as bad as you think it is. I did not go tinsel crazier. I actually used what's called Aurora Angelina. It's the only one I use, and it's opaque, and it blends in. So if I ever put glitz in anything, it's this. But this looks really glitzy. But what it is, is this is green and purple. And the green seems to take the glitz and just bounce it amazingly on a camera. When you're looking at it in person, it does not look overdone. When you're looking at it, at a camera, it looks, and this is the side that has the least in it, so that you can see the colors, and it's just, that was where I took it off, and it really didn't get a whole lot there, it was like the last couple of turns, this has more, but even if you flip it over and on this side, this looks like I've overdone, it's green, it's not all <laughs> glitz and glam, so, um, yeah. It is what it is. You know how that goes. Um, so we really like it. Um, the deep purple and the greens. And it's it's actually a very, very green green. It's not an aqua green. But it's really pretty. The bat itself is really pretty. And you wouldn't think that the greens and the purples and... Let's see. Let's sit here. Back here, I guess. <laughs> right there but now it looks like it has no glitz in it and I'm looking at it and it has all glitz in it. <laughs> so um, anyway this was just a little different and then I played with some glitz and glam and the cutie fiber uh, for the first time we're going to offer some cutie fiber to sell and this is it takes 
the dye even better than the um, Cotswold does, which is what I had on the others. So I had these. Um, and then I did some experimenting with blacks. Uh, so I we have bats. Now I'm going to um, we're going to redesign our band that goes around our bats and we're going to get rid of the plastic. And I told you I'm trying to watch my plastic thumbprint and even though we reuse these, I just really, really, really want something else that is biodegradable and not so bad for things. So um, I worked on those. I will be working on some new bags, um, just because, like I said, we've got one booth that's going to be bags and one booth that's going to be fiber. So we'll get those done. But other than that, I think you are totally up to date. My rambling's on about the treasure. Um, I will try and cut some of those short, cut them out because there's just too many things that I want to share, and just too many things are are awesome. Um, the only other thing that I did was I've been working on paperwork, getting all of our registered stock and our memberships up to date. I've got to do the Dorset. I still have to call them and find out when it <coughs> expires, but I think I do it in the spring when I register our babies. Um, the Moreno one is already done. The one that was coming due now. Um, in September is the American Quarter Horse Precious, so we got that done. But pretty much we're just working on a lot of little things. Bye.